All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Transportation in a Time of Climate Crisis. This is the third in a series of webinars uh, presented by the West Coast Climate Action Network. Uh, my name is Dean Murdoch. I have the great honor of being the MC for this afternoon's uh, webinar. Um, my thanks to Guy Dauncey, who uh, invited me to be part of uh, today's event and to uh, sit in with some excellent guest speakers and uh, to join you all here this afternoon. Before we get started, I want to uh, begin with a territorial acknowledgement. So I'm joining today from the uh, traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation, that borders on the traditional territories of the Wasanich peoples, uh, the Sanchothan speaking peoples, which are the, uh, the Sartlip, the Sakem and Sayout First Nations, the Wasanich nations on the Saanich Peninsula. And uh, the traditional territories, the ancestral territories of the Wasanich, uh, the story is told that uh, the creator threw uh, four white rocks to mark the territory of the Wasanich peoples. One landed in uh, Elwa River in Washington State, another landed on Salt Spring Island. Uh, the third landed, appropriately enough, in White Rock, BC, obviously uh, the reason for that name. And uh, the fourth landed on what we colonially refer to as Mount Douglas. Uh, which in St. Jothan is known as Pakals, Pakals meaning white rock. Uh, and I live uh, probably a five minute walk from Pakals and I look up to the mountain uh, on a daily basis and am reminded uh, of that story and the um, traditional keepers of this land, uh, the St. Jothan speaking people, the Wasanich nations. And what an honor it is uh, to be here uh, on these lands. Um, for those who have a chance to introduce yourselves in the chat, we encourage you to also acknowledge uh, the territories where you are joining us from today. Um, it's my great pleasure to, to get this event kicked off. Um, I, uh, I won't spend a lot of time uh, talking about myself, you'll be relieved to hear. Uh, I am in politics, so I do get a lot of opportunity to talk about myself, but I won't do a lot of that today. Um, I... Uh, uh, I think my connection to this world is probably uh, on two fronts, one from a, a transportation uh, community's perspective as a former municipal councillor for the district of Saanich, uh, and uh, incidentally, a candidate for mayor in the district of Saanich in the upcoming municipal election. Uh, and also uh, from a professional perspective, uh, I had the great pleasure of serving in the role of um, provincial lead for healthy communities. So the idea of building complete uh, communities is near and dear to my heart from, um, uh, from both a professional perspective and, uh, and someone who has spent a lot of time in an advocacy and, and elected role um, uh, pursuing the policies that would help us create more complete communities. So today uh, we are uh, convening for the third in a series of West Coast Climate Action Network's uh, webinars called Transportation in the Time of the Climate Crisis. The West Coast Climate Action Network was founded last year and has 222 organization members spread all across British Columbia. You can find its website at westcoastclimateaction.ca. Its six teams are busy with various initiatives and it publishes a major newsletter every Friday. So be sure to check that out and subscribe if you haven't already. The focus of today's webinar is one that means a lot to me and that's complete communities or which we also sometimes call the 15 minute city. The next webinar is on June 8th and will focus on car sharing, electric vehicles and urban freight. Be sure to check that one out and register uh, to be part of that special event. In each webinar, we aim to lay out the best transportation policies and solutions for a socially just, inclusive, and flourishing British Columbia that uses 100% renewable energy. Before we start, we'd like to do quick, two quick polls. So Sebastian's going to pull up the first poll, and that is, where do you live? And there you'll see a number of options on the board. I can ask that you please select which one you're joining us from. Give me just a second to do that. Okay. 
know, Sebastian, you can probably see better than I if everyone's had a chance to enter their vote. And I think we can probably pull that up. There we go. So most folks are on uh, the island or the coast. A few folks joining us from the lower mainland and the rest of it disappeared before I could see it. There we go. Uh, Thompson, Okanagan and the Kootenays and North Coast also represented in on today's webinar. So thanks all for joining us uh, in your part of the province today. Uh, the second poll question is, are you familiar with the concept of complete communities? Yes, so-so, or not yet? And regardless of your answer, good news, you're in the right place. Once everybody's had a chance to answer, there we go. Well, look at that, a pretty even split between yes and so-so. Um, and a few people who are not yet familiar, but are soon to be very familiar. So looks like a good mix of, uh, of participants uh, here to eager to hear the words of our guest speakers today. So um, I'm delighted to hear from them. I happen to have had a chance to uh, hear from them both in the past a few times, actually. And uh, when I was hosting a uh, podcast on uh, local issues called Amazing Places, which is now hosted by uh, the very talented Michelle Seeley, and you can find that wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Amazing Places. I, I had the great pleasure of uh, interviewing uh, both of today's speakers at, at different times. Uh, and I can tell you that they are always extremely informative and uh, I learned a lot in, uh, in each of the opportunities I had to hear from them. So our guest speakers are uh, Christine Lintot. She's a Victoria-based architect who practices community, build, community building and product design across the province. Um, tuned to regenerative approaches to build environment solutions, she creates progressive and climate adaptive designs for built environments. She's a certified bio, bi oh wow, I need to practice this one, biomimicry professional. That sounds like, a, I, you'll have to tell us more about biomimicry. Uh, and uses biomimicry to advance nature's lessons in her design. Her website is uh, uh, lootarchitect.ca. Um, I'll also do a quick uh, intro of Todd Littman because uh, after Christine's wrapped up, we're going to go straight to Todd to, to say a few words. So um, Todd is the founder and executive director of the Victoria Transport Policy Institute, an independent research organization dedicated to developing innovative solutions to transport problems. His worldwide work helps expand the range of impacts and options that are considered in transportation and urban planning improve evaluation methods and make specialized technical concepts accessible to a large audience. And his website is vtpi.org. So I'm just going to turn it over now to Christine who is going to share uh, with us first. So Christine, thanks so much for being here. Over to you. Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. It really is a privilege uh, to be part of this conversation and to share some thoughts. In British Columbia, community planning is enabled by provincial imperative. Uh, the province requires local governments to establish regional growth strategies, which are to be designed to promote patterns of settlement that are socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable. The objective is to make efficient use of infrastructure and land and to enhance resilience. Contrary to a model of urban sprawl, the regional growth strategy works toward ensuring that development takes place where there is adequate facilities to minimize the use of automobiles and encourage alternate transportation modes to support adequate, affordable and appropriate housing and engage in good stewards, stewardship of the land for present and future generations. <clears throat> there is precedent for achieving all of these objectives in the urban environments. Old world cities like Barcelona tick many of the boxes of what we imagine compact, complete communities to be. These are the places that we admire and love to visit. One commonality is that these places have evolved over time. They have, like a mature ecosystem, 
continued to evolve, adapt, and become increasingly complex over generations. While the pattern of settlement, the bones of the place are traceable, there is continued adaptation to evolving inhabitation, meaning that these places remain relevant. The fact that these places are continuously inhabited and thriving speaks to resilience. Staying with old world cities, this is a map of Hamburg. Rather than the bones of the city, the figure ground of buildings or the imposed geometries of roadways that we typically explore, this is a mapping of the green spaces and the urban waterways. Layers on a map in this urban context, these landscape attributes in cities, water, vegetation, ground cover, tree canopy, are vital to ecological function. They are the arteries that sustain us. Hamburg's ecological layering highlights the importance of investment in the in-between, both preserving existing green spaces and introducing new ones is vital. The patchwork of green spaces present in cities need be preserved and enhanced alongside densification. Perhaps even more critical in proximity and accessible to higher concentrations of people. Evolving the public right of way or reimagining the street is also key. This is tinkering with a land base that often equates to 50% of the land area of a given city, enabling car independence for individuals while continuing to service and distribute. Evolving includes enhancing or introducing greenscapes and bluescapes, daylighting waterways, not simply putting services in the ground or planting a street tree. These approaches increase complexity and introduce redundancy in the urban system. This is about maturing in response to population pressures. It is about adaptation over time. <laughs> Protected bike lanes are an example of successfully adapting the public right of way to safely and efficiently support alternative transportation modes Incentivizing and prioritizing these adaptations is foundational for increased density in tighter, more compact urban places. Recognizing the value of a mature urban forest to human experience and how it transforms our public right of ways. Investing in planting today and continuing to evolve the forest, including replacement and renewal valuing the ecological function of vegetation and trees, affording resilience through functions such as temperature regulation, air and water filtration. Investment in the management of water in urban environments that affords greater resilience over singular approaches of gray engineering. Introducing redundancy to these hard pipe systems that are sometimes at the end of their lives while also introducing a soundscape and visual amenity along the public right of way. Texturing and layering of strategies across any right of way and prioritizing the maintenance of these ecological functions within municipal ledgers. Valuing ecological performance and measuring the municipal assets as a community matures and ensuring valuations are operationalized in decision-making on expenditures. Adapting and sustaining the public realm supports alternative transportation choices. Individuals, families, and households are choosing to live without car ownership and embracing walking, cycling, car share memberships, and public transportation. The investment in a meaningful public realm or a meaningful urban realm, adoption of car share and ride share initiatives, and frequent convenient, bu convenient bus service all play a role in influencing the nature of the demand on streets. Enabling the establishment and growth of neighborhood amenities arises from neighborhood planning with a focus on walkability and more immediate access to local goods and services. These are corner stores, coffee shops, pubs, doctor's offices, hair salons, and yoga studios. One or more amenities that are frequented by a local clientele. 
Official community plans identify neighborhood nodes and need to be devised to respond flexibly to these initiatives, recognizing the value of walkability and livability. Innovation in community planning need evaluate the potential of prioritizing zoning objectives, not simply applying them. Think of the tension between on-site parking and green space or front doors and street presence to vehicle access and driveways. It means looking at alternative zoning approaches as well as establishing objectives that inform housing that is scaled to fit into mature existing neighborhoods and reflects prioritizing people and ecology over the automobile. This is particularly important in complete communities that are inherently walkable, served by alternative transportation and amenities, and meet the diverse needs of a range of households. Architecture that is durable and beautiful endures. It is the canvas upon which urban life adapts and evolves. Good bones are the foundation of cities. Paying attention to parts of a community that have stood the test of time, that remain inhabited, speak to relevance. These places sustain lives and get better with age. Often these parts are right-sized and scaled to support in increased density. Use regulations are best if flexible enabling reuse and re-inhabitation over time as the needs of the community evolve. While non-conforming to current planning and building codes, they can be grandfathered and often creatively adapted to intent. Flexibility is key. In older residential neighborhoods composing many of our communities, compact infill housing forms including the duplex, triplex, fourplex, courtyard apartments, bungalow courts, townhouses, and multiplexes existed historically prior to the 1940s. These typologies remain the foundation of affordability in many communities, while also housing a range of household sizes from individuals to families. All of these compact housing types are house scaled often two or two and a half stories and are meaningful and relevant precedent for infill strategies as communities evolve. Densifying existing neighborhoods with new development necessitates relevant design solutions. Arguably, these, form, these forms are style agnostic, quality, durability, and whole design over subjective character treatments. This example of a contemporary duplex is nested in a mature neighborhood with adjacent housing stock that is of a traditional character. Yet it fits as it is consistent in scale and proportion how the housing addresses the street and the reprioritization of green space and landscaping over parking. For communal living, clustered housing that is oriented around a shared or common space appeals particularly to smaller households or single person households where a sense of connection and security is inherent in the design. This infill type is one of smaller homes around a green space. This form may also emerge from a neighborhood scale reprioritizing of green space, connecting neighbors to neighbors with infill building types in the mix, alongside established single family homes, laneway houses, garden suites, and coach houses. Perhaps block-wide initiatives that encourage a common rather than the individual yards. Acknowledging precedent of the houseplex, attainable economics for housing may be introduced into an existing neighborhood. Land costs are, are distributed across more households. These forms are incremental in scale and developable within a walkable, mature neighborhood. This housing development recently approved in Victoria is almost indistinguishable from its neighbors. It proposes 24 households within a reduced on-site parking provision. In this case, the site plan was not driven by the automobile, but by the consideration of context, scale, and right sizing of the units. This is a visual reminder of the importance of designing the in-between, no matter the scale. 
thinking about every aspect of how buildings and spaces can be designed to support life and the activities of life. The idea of mapping toward a whole rather than singular solutions on individual lots. Completeness and resilience emerges from increasing complexity in communities and an evolution of neighborhoods, not reinvention. It acknowledges households of today and aligns a built form that reinforces lifestyle choice. It needs a regulatory environment that prioritizes a diversity of forms within defined regions, invites innovation, and is serviced by streets that are sustaining of people and the planet. Perhaps what is needed most is the courage of cathedral thinking, the bold aspiration of the unattainable within a single election cycle or even a single generation. Right investment in design and policy decisions to enable evolution over time, adaptability over certainty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, I think uh, I'm not seeing questions showing up in the chat at the moment. Perhaps the best thing to do at this point is to go to Todd and then uh, if we have a chance for questions afterwards, we can do that. So thank you so much, Christine. I loved it, loved the photos, some amazing photos in there. And of course, uh, my heart always leaps anytime I see a, a, a cute puppy in the photo too. So well done. Uh, some really good visual images there uh, and some uh, excellent uh, words of, uh, of wisdom as well. My, my thanks to you. Uh, we're going to go to Todd Littman now, who uh, I know will have uh, lots of great things to share with us as well. So Todd, over to you. Uh, you're muted, Todd. Okay, thanks. there we go. Thanks, Dean, and thanks everybody for participating. Um, I appreciate this chance to share some of my research on how to build what we can call uh, sustainable and resilient communities, or I like the term urban villages. Let's look at one of my favorite walks. This is my front porch, and walking down my street. Some people, those of you who have lived in or visited Victoria might rec recognize Vic High, Victoria High School. And we walked through the field that used to exist. It's now under construction, but this is what it looks like when you arrive at one of my favorite destinations, our local pub. Now, one of my definitions of a sustainable community is a place where most people can walk to their local coffee shops and pubs without having to drive. Why does that create sustainability? Well, if I drive rather than walk to my pub, I'm not having to use a car. So when I return home, I'm not endangering myself and my neighbors if I've been drinking. But also notice our little neighborhood uh, commercial center here, what you could call an urban village. It's on a two lane road. It's on a narrow road and it has minimum off street parking. The space here was built before cars became common. And so um, it's very pedestrian oriented. If everybody who drove there, everybody who visited there had to drive, we would need to expand that road. And we would have to tear down some of those buildings in order to build more parking. Um, if I walk rather than uh, drive to my local uh, business district, I'm saving money. So I have more money to spend. I'm sp saving money on vehicles and fuel. So I have more money to spend on local goods like food and drinks and I'm getting more exercise so I can consume more without getting fat. I'm producing less noise and air pollution so I'm creating a more livable neighborhood. 
These are all benefits of creating a community where it's normal for people when they're running errands or visiting friends or participating in, in uh, activities are able to get there by walking and bicycling or public transit rather than driving. This doesn't mean everybody has to give up driving altogether. You'll see that our neighborhood village does accommodate some car travel, but it's much less than what occurs in a, in a community that's built around the car. So let's see what that means in terms of community planning. Um, I describe this kind of neighborhood as an urban village, which means that most of the services and activities that people engage in are available within a 10 or 15 minute walk. So we sometimes call this a 15 minute neighborhood or a 15 minute city. It means it's easy to get around without owning a car. And that frees people up. It's especially good for somebody who can't drive, but it's even also good for people who could afford, can drive and could afford a car. But it means, for example, that parents don't have to spend as much time chauffeuring their adolescent children. Or uh, if your car does break down, you're not in a crisis. It, it, it ensures equity and efficiency. It means that people who cannot or should not or prefer not to drive are able to get around. There's some interesting tools now. Uh, one that's called Walk Score that indicates from any place that you identify the, where you could walk within 10 or 15 minutes. It allows you to set that. So this, um, the map on the right is uh, looking from um, the center of the Cook Street Village and it's asking what are the areas that somebody could reach within a 10 minute walk? And that allows us to start planning what does an urban village look like? And what do we need to ensure that we can accommodate that? So walk score is a nice indicator of, of this type of uh, walkable, dense uh, or compact urban development. Um, it, it, the, um, you, can, you can set the, if you go to the walk score website, you can set it to the heat map. So it uses colors to show uh, which areas are very walkable. That's green, indicating a walk score over 70. Yellow means a walk score of 50 to 70. And, um, and brown means under 50. So if you were, let's say, deciding where to live, or you were considering where to build a building, or you were in charge of building housing for people with disabilities, or you want, a, a, you want to find a house where, um, where you, can walk your, you can easily walk your dog, you want to make sure that your community is a, a, is a walkable community. It has a high walk score, uh, typically more than se uh, a 70 walk score. And this is, a, this is a very useful way to start thinking about our community design and your own household location decisions. If you, if you live in a walkable neighborhood, you're saving on transportation costs, you have more independent mobility for non-drivers, you're improving safety and health, you're increasing economic resilience and opportunity, and you're reducing traffic problems. This graph shows the actual portion of trips made by walking and bicycling and public transit, you could call them the non-automobile -automo modes in various parts of our region. So if you look region-wide, the Capital Regional District, um, about 20% of trips are made by walking, bicycling, and public transit. But when you look at Victoria, and especially during the peak periods, you reach about 40% of trips are non-auto travel. And when you're talking about downtown Victoria or other commercial centers like the Cook Street Village or Oak Bay Village, about half of all trips are made without a car. So this suggests that we can achieve very high multimodal uh, 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 travel patterns. And this is, this is uh, only the beginning. We can, we can do a lot more 
to create more walkable and bikeable and transit oriented communities. And we can achieve much higher rates of walking and bicycling in public transit. Um, one of the outcomes of this is the, the communities become much more affordable. Uh, for a typical household, um, a typical household uh, that lives in an automobile dependent area spends about $10,000 a year or more on automobile on a transportation, where if you live in a more walkable neighborhood, you can easily get that down to one car costing about $5,000 a year or live a car free lifestyle spending less than $1,000 a year on on local transportation you're saving a lot of money. Um, how do we do that we can there are many ways that we can create communities uh, allow more people to live in these you know in a walking in a walkable urban uh, village. Um, in fact, many of the older neighborhoods have these attributes. The challenge is that those have become unaffordable. The question, there are two ways to address that. One is that any new community that we built should be built on uh, urban village principles. And we should do more to ensure that there's affordable housing in the existing urban neighborhoods. So to do that, we need to uh, increase allowable densities and heights so we can build more of the lower cost housing types, things like townhouses and low rise apartments. We can reform our project approval and fee structures to encourage more infill development and discourage sprawl. We can reduce the fees and approval requirements for smaller and more, mo more uh, moderate priced housing when it's built. We can reduce and eliminate parking minimums so uh, car free households are no longer forced to pay for costly parking facilities that they don't need. And we can incentivize uh, the, the land use policies so we can consolidate uh, parcels to create the kind of, the kind of uh, uh, development that, that uh, maximizes the affordable housing in the existing urban villages. Here are some examples of the types of housing that are currently not legal to build in most urban neighborhoods that many of, many of us love and create, if we create a lot of them, we would have a lot more affordable housing. This map shows for the city of Victoria where that type of multimodal housing, uh, townhouses and low rise apartments are forbidden or allowed. Yellow, is what's called traditional residential. And that's where you can only build single family, low density housing. The, the higher, uh, uh, higher density, lower cost housing types are not allowed. And so that um, this uh, limiting where the more affordable housing types can be built explains what is a, is a major point uh, explanation as to why cities like Victoria and Vancouver are the housing is so expensive because we we're no longer building the lower priced housing types. Uh, this is the city of Vancouver's zoning map. Again, the yellow indicates that uh, townhouses and uh, and and low rise apartments are not allowed in the majority of land areas. Now, to contrast this, consider the beautiful city of Montreal. Um, the, there, the city has allowed townhouses and low-rise apartments in the, in the majority of the residential land area, in about uh, almost 60% of the, of, the, of the residential neighborhoods land allows townhouses and apartments, low-rise apartments. And as a result, the, the majority of people in the majority of households in Montreal do live in uh, compact housing types and the housing is far more affordable. Uh, using a recent uh, housing price survey, it indicates that in Montreal, the, the average or the, the median one bedroom apartment uh, rents for uh, less than of $1,400 a month compared with almost $2,000 a month for the same size apartment in Vancouver. And, um, 
And also in Victoria, $1,600 a month. It is 20 to 40% cheaper in Montreal because they have better uh, land use, uh, they have more uh, flexible zoning codes. So uh, this, map, this uh, set of maps compares the portion of uh, the land in various cities, various Canadian cities that allow the higher density townhouses and apartments. And um, in Montreal, it's by far the smallest or the largest amount of land. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that if we allow more uh, in, in Montreal, uh, because most households live in compact housing types in walkable urban neighborhoods, they uh, uh, residents drive far less, generate uh, spend far less on transportation and generate far less transportation pollution. So um, we do have solutions to our uh, um, housing affordability, our health and safety goals, and our environmental goals by creating, allowing more compact housing in our existing walkable urban neighborhoods. For more information, visit our website and I'll post on the chat box um, some of my recent research on this subject. Thank you very much, Todd. Uh, very informative and loved the uh, virtual tour through your neighborhood as well as we made our way to, uh, to the pub following, uh, following you by camera. Mm -hmm. um, I see that uh, there's uh, been quite a bit going on in the Q&A and quite a bit in the chat. I think before we dive into the Q&A, uh, we were going to go to Guy, who's going to tell us about uh, a policy paper. Uh, and then uh, and then I think it'll be an opportunity to talk about the questions. Guy, over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, so we haven't finished this yet, but with the municipal elections coming up this in October, we're gradually putting together policy papers like what are the, the, the 10, the clear, simple best policies to create complete communities at the municipal level and also at the provincial level. So, you know, are there any provincial changes that need to the Urban Planning Act or Regional Growth Act or anything like that? But we haven't got that complete yet. Christine has been going through COVID and, and Jean's been through going through COVID as well. So these things slow you up, these things, but we'll get it done and we'll have a good policy paper ready for you. Thanks then. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, thanks, uh, Christine and Todd. Uh, there's some questions here in the Q&A. Um, some of them seem a bit general. Some of them seem a little more targeted at, uh, at what, uh, what you've been sharing with us. Um, <clears throat> I don't know uh, the best way to, to handle this, Guy or Sebastian. Normally, would you uh, read them out and uh, have somebody respond? Or what, what would normally be your approach here? I would suggest that you go ahead and read them out, Dina. Okay, so first one is coming from uh, Sunil, who says, how do municipalities encourage consolidation of smaller parcels and build more density without inflating land values? Well, very good point, Sunil. Making housing increasingly more expensive for younger generations. Sure, let me, let me uh, uh, respond to that. Um, the, the question, the, the, the housing affordability question is, not what is the land price, but what is the uh, land price per uh, housing unit? So for example, a single family house uses a quarter, can easily use a quarter acre of land per house, where if you have townhouses, you can take that same quarter acre and you can have six to 12 houses. And if you allow low rise apartments, you can have on that same parcel 10 to, to 25 houses. So um, the, 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 the key metric is what does it cost? How much land do you need per housing unit? And what we find, the reason that cities like Montreal are so affordable is because they allow land efficient types of housing. They allow those townhouses and uh, low-rise apartments that are far more, that, that are, they, they yield far more homes per unit of land, per hectare or acre. 
Thank you, Todd. Uh, Christine, do you want to weigh in on that one as well? Yeah, I think, um, I, you know, Todd um, is spot on. It's not about inflation of land value so much as how many, how many individual parcels can you get on a, on a, uh, a piece of land that has um, a certain value attributed to it. Uh, and then, um, you know, offsetting that against multiples effectively. But I think, you know, sort of at the root of the question is how do municipalities encourage consolidation of smaller parcels? And I think that, you know, goes to the root of, you know, there's no single kind of thread to pull. It really is a kind of consideration of um, the notion of mix of uses, the notion that you need to, within tighter regions, um, really exploring those ideas of uh, allowing for um, work and play and recreation and, and all of those things to occur within nodes and neighborhoods, such that um, there, is, um, there is supported densification. There is the ability to actually um, uh, allow for that and incentivize that kind of intensification of the use of land. Um, in the absence of those services, in the absence of those mix of uses, um, we end up with neighborhoods that are um, really homogenous. They are those neighborhoods that, that really um, are sustained in their single family um, sort of characteristic. Great, thank you both. Um, so there's some really great questions in here. One of them is about if you're running for mayor or council, which I would love to answer, but this isn't about me. And I don't think either uh, Todd or Christine have designs on doing that, at least in this municipal election. So uh, I, we won't put that question to them directly, but I am curious if anybody out there is a candidate who wants to give it uh, a go at that in the chat, uh, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, one of the questions I see is about uh, how industrial land fits into the equation of complete communities. Well, if I could answer, we need all types of activities. Yeah. Um, there are some activities that are stinky and noisy. And so you don't want those, in, you don't, most people don't want them uh, on the, let's say on the same block. But uh, for example, um, uh, the Victoria core, the gorge area demonstrates that you can have industrial activities uh, near residential. They don't have to be right next door. Um, it is good policy to preserve enough industrial, la uh, enough land for industrial uses that you're supporting those activities and those jobs. So I think that is very important. The thing that I am, uh, let's say I am struck with most is that if most people seem to like mixed use, that is a neighborhood where you can, uh, you have uh, stores and restaurants with housing above, what we call residential over commercial and um, a mixed use building and yet that's the type of, of, of development that's currently not allowed in most neighborhoods. In 80% in, in of the land in Victoria, you couldn't just build a, 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 a pizza, pizza with a pizza store with a, or a pizza restaurant with, a, with housing above or a, or a, um, or a mixed uh, or, a, um, or a, a loft apartments where live work activities are allowed, those are not allowed. And those are, they're not, uh, they're not particularly stinky and dangerous unless you really don't like the smell of pizza. But um, most, th there are no, there are good reasons to allow more of the types of land use mix that really maximize the amount of activity, the number of homes and jobs that we can have within a, within a compact area in an in a urban village. So that's the type of reform that I, I think is particularly important, allowing mixed use compact development up to three to uh, um, up to three stories at a minimum and up to uh, five or six stories in the in the in the in the core areas. Christine, do you want to take a shot at the uh, industrial land uh, uh, question as well? 
Yeah, I mean, some of the most interesting parts of our city are those um, remnants of um, industrial activity um, that have evolved over time, that notion of evolution. Um, you know, decidedly, there are certain activities that we don't want to be against, depending on, you know, whether we're, whatever it is, whatever activities um, that we're um, participating in. But I, I couldn't agree more with Todd. We do need those range of uses. We do need to promote um, inclusion of industrial activities um, in um, complete communities. And I think for me, what it comes down to is scale, the scale at which those operations are taking place. Obviously, large manufacturing uh, plants are um, incongruous with a, with a compact, complete community. But smaller scale industrial type activities, um, we see it all over, um, are, are relevant um, and frankly essential um, to a vibrant um, community uh, and to encouraging support of where people both work, live and play. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions that uh, relate to uh, low rise versus high rise. Um, one is coming from Mary Wagner in Langford and another from Pam Harrison, who I know uh, from Livable Roads for Rural Saanich. Um, and the variations on the question of, uh, of what is more appropriate, Pam asks, uh, with respect to mental health, uh, she's aware of some research on uh, what happens in higher density or, or um, or uh, high-rise buildings rather, not higher density, high-rise buildings. Uh, yeah. So what, um, Todd, you mentioned uh, three to six uh, stories being sort of optimal. What, uh, what is the take on uh, what's better for us as, uh, as human beings in terms of our, our well-being and getting to know our neighbors? Well, um, different people have different needs and that's, that's the beauty of a, a good, well-designed city responds to diverse demands. So there, you can think of it from a life cycle perspective. There may be times in your life where, uh, where you, uh, uh, let's say you, or, or in some people where you, let's say you have a big dog and so you need a big yard or you have children that, you, that, that like to play. Um, that's not a, you, you might, that might be the time in life where you want a single family house or you want the type of house that Christine was showing where uh, it's, a, it's a house with shared yards among, among many houses. And you're, you, you, at that time in your life, maybe you don't wanna live in an apartment. On the other hand, uh, let's say you're a young adult and the last thing you want to spend your, you don't want to spend your weekends mowing a lawn. Um, you, maybe you're doing a lot of traveling and you want a place where you can just walk up and leave. That's a good time to live in an apartment. Maybe you're a senior and you don't want the responsibilities of a, um, of a, of a single family house. So there are, there are lots of people, lots of times in people's lives where it does make sense to live in um, in, in, in shared housing. Um, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that high rise is inherently unhealthy. I think a lot of the current designs may, may not support community activities. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the way we, what we call the connection between the building and the sidewalk or the building and the pedestrian environment. If we do a good job, it's not the height of the building, it's the quality of the interaction. Um, so um, I'm a, I, I, my, my, my emphasis is on uh, making sure that there's the type of housing that meets the diverse needs of diverse people and that we're not biased against the higher density housing for those people who prefer it or who need it at that point in their life. Christine, do you want to take a shot at the question of high versus low rise? Yeah, <clears throat> well, the fact that I showed um, Barcelona probably shows my cards pretty clearly. Um, I love the story and I've, I've never actually um, uh, checked it out, but the, apparently um, the, the building, and I apologize, I don't, uh, the name is, uh, is, uh, is escaping me right at the moment, um, but the, down at the, uh, at the Inner Harbor, there's a building that used to have Sam's Deli in it. Like, somebody helped me out with the name of the building. But as I understand it, that has a density of seven to one. 
Um, if you ever came into a public hearing and told people in the city of Victoria that you were going for seven to one, um, you know, you'd, you, you'd be sort of chased out of town. So the fact that this, and I believe that it's six stories, and I could be wrong, it could be seven stories, but it's an exquisite artifact to the history of this town. And yet it accommodates, it, it's a mix of uses. Um, it's a range of, of different um, scales of spaces. Um, it's been adaptive continue, continuously over time. And its strength, it's in an exquisite location. But I believe its strength is its, its, its absolute connection to the street and its legibility as a, as a person in the city and, and experiencing the city, um, being able to participate in um, understanding what that building's about. Um, so the minute we, we extrude um, buildings and we, we attenuate, um, perhaps in the interest of density, um, I, I'd like to call us a little bit on that. And I think it's more um, about view often um, and the harnessing and harvesting of view um, for the individual. Um, but this idea of extruding in order to achieve that kind of densification is uh, a little bit of a um, a little bit of a challenge that I think we we always have to look at. And I'm really looking at um, the question that said, should we be doing towers in Langford? Um, that that really speaks to that the core of the question, which is context is everything. The fact that um, you have in you know in Manhattan you have um, high rises that is a that is an entirely different question of health and wellness and connection and community than um, say introducing um, high rises to Langford, for instance. Um, so you know that was a, a rambly way of saying. Um, I think connection to the ground matters. I think connection to the street matters significantly. Um, it helps us identify and have relationship with other people and, and the place in which we dwell. Um, we're not limited to uh, a simple vertical um, a mobility device and the, the off chance someone might get in with us. We actually engage with the street and we engage with our community in a different way. Um, and there was also a question about um, the connection with tree cover. Um, and I think that's an important aspect as well. Um, this idea of buildings not being sort of in isolation, but in fact being part of the structure, the sculpture of, of the skyscape, which includes in a healthy, complete community, um, that tree cover. Um, which is essential for our wellness. It creates cooling. Um, there's um, the moisture and the microclimates that are that are generated from that forest canopy or that urban forest is profound um, and essential to our wellness and our and our sense of well-being. Uh, great answers there. Thank you both uh, very much. Um, there are a number of really good questions coming into the Q&A. Uh, I'm just being mindful of the time that we have available. I know there's another poll question that we wanted to ask participants. Um, so Sebastian, I wondered if we could uh, pull up that third poll now. And that question is, do you think municipalities should adjust their planning and zoning rules to turn their neighborhoods into complete communities? And your options there are yes, maybe, or probably not. So I'll give you a moment to think about that one. Should municipalities adjust their planning and zoning rules to turn neighborhoods into complete communities? And let's see, look at that. Uh, of course, 95% uh, in favor, 5% uh, maybe, and nobody dismissing it outright, but uh, maybe a little more uh, evidence uh, needed in order to push that last 5%. Um, I, uh, I'm just aware that we're going on five at this point, and I think that's probably about the amount of time we had promised folks for today. Um, 
there, which is uh, unfortunate because there are some really excellent questions uh, coming in in the Q&A, which uh, I know we'd probably all love to hear the panelists respond to. Uh, I'm really curious about the one related to uh, the Vancouver House special or a special house. I also saw that CBC article and thought that was an interesting idea. Uh, but I think that's probably a place where we're going to need to to wrap things up unless I've grossly misinterpreted the amount of time we were supposed to spend together today. Um, but I don't see anybody waving it off. So I think uh, we're going to move forward with the closing, uh, closing remarks on today's uh, session. Um, I just want to thank so much uh, both Todd and Christine for sharing their, their wisdom and knowledge with us today. Uh, what a tremendous uh, benefit it has been uh, for me and, and I know for all of the folks here uh, who've joined us on the webinar to hear uh, what you've had to share. Uh, what a true delight to get the benefit uh, of, your, uh, of your knowledge. Um, this, uh, this webinar, of course, has been recorded, and so we'll be sharing a link as soon as uh, it's been uploaded to YouTube, so folks will have a chance to take a look at it uh, and uh, review it. Uh, some of the responses, well, all of the responses will be captured as part of that, so you can go back and hear what, uh, what people said. The final webinar is coming up on June 8th, also at 4 o'clock, and it will have a focus on car sharing, electric vehicles, and urban freight. I think Sebastian's got an image uh, of that upcoming session that he can put up for us. Uh, there it is. I just have to move my Q and A's out of the way. Car sharing EVs and urban freight on June 8th um, with the uh, speakers you see listed there. Um, Guy, I saw a hand go up from you. I think maybe you had uh, something you wanted to say before we wrap this up all together. I just wanted to thank you so much for taking this time to, um, to MC for us and to wish you all the best in your run to be mayor of Saanich. Wow. Uh, looking forward to success on that front. And thanks everyone else for joining us. And to all climate champions, we do encourage people to think about seriously about putting your name in the hat if you're a climate champion to run for council. We need a 5-4 vote in favour of progressive initiatives on councils or a 3-4 a, a vote if you're a small council of seven. We need that majority. So one seat can make all the difference. So thanks everyone for joining us and thank you too, Dean. Yeah. And thanks Sebastian for work behind the scenes. Thank you all. Thank you very much.